He was very unique in all aspects. Uh, he thought he was a comedian. Uh, he always wanted to make people laugh. He never wanted to be sad or anything. He had a great spirit. Um, like I said, he was very loving and uplifting to everyone. He always gave me a, a certain a level of respect. Um, he would, whenever I, I talked to him, he would, he would, you know, listen and he t would take and res respect the advice that I would give him. And uh, I, I just, I just always uh, appreciated. It. Like, like I don't know how long the talk would last, but for a moment, I. I felt like I could get through to him and uh, just calm him down a little bit whenever he was going having a moment. Andron was my first and only grandson. He was my poppy. As he told everybody, nobody could call him poppy, but it's Nana. So now he's my heart, my love, and now he's my angel. And I carry him with me every day. Every time I leave out the house, I have him with me. So. so Andron was my baby, but I couldn't let him know that he was my baby <laughs> because I had to be the strong one and I had to be the backbone. I didn't want him to know that he was my baby because I didn't want him to think that he can get away with anything with me, okay? Um, he was very sweet, loving, respectful young man, he had lots of energy. And like my sister said, basketball was his passion. He loved basketball, like that was his like, that was his thing, like, that's all he wanted to do, was play basketball. Funny, real funny, probably got that for me, so. But, <laughs> good kid, man, just could have did anything he wanted to do. Funny, he was bad as said in some aspects, you know. But he was a child, so you know all kids got to learn at some point in time. But he was funny. He was outgoing. I played basketball with him a lot. He was a good hooper, you know. I loved him. Everybody loved him. He was, you know, a lovable person. I remember our summers um, when we would go visit my nana, and our uncle would take us to the basketball courts, and. I used to whoop him. <laughs> he was good, but I was better. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a lot of fun together. He was really funny. Um, like my sister said, he, he, he loved to make jokes. He also think that he can rap. <laughs> it was hilarious. His mom used to do it to when, when I was younger, like the little freestyles and stuff, and he like picked it up for real, for real from her. And you know, she was funny with it, so he was funny with it, you know, he got it from somewhere. He was actually supposed to graduate this year, which he was very excited about because his Nana and his grandpa promised him whatever car he wanted. So of course he was gonna make that happen. <laughs> he was mine, you know, he was lovable. You know, he loved his family. Like Brandy said earlier, he loved his family. He loved his siblings. He loved his mom and dad, his aunts. You know, he was just a loving boy. And he was just like any other little typical boy, you know, be mischief, but no harm, no harm, no foul done. But he was mine. If he had something and you ain't happy, he'd always make sure that you had a piece. Like if, if he had something like, you know, just stuff like that. He always makes sure that he broke bread. He loved everyone. Um, he made sure he helped as much people as he can. Even when he didn't have anything for himself, he still made sure that everyone around him was okay. And he was just a very loving person. He was a champion, man. He was a conqueror, man. He was a fighter. Man. Just, I mean, so much, man, a good person, man. He just, man. Just like anything, like, just even if we was just sitting in the room, we was just always having fun. We was just out and about, just outside, just play basketball sometimes, just little stuff.
My brother, he, he taught me a lot. Um, not just what it meant to be a big sister, but his death also awoke me to deep-rooted systemic and social failures of society. Um, substance abuse disorder is seen as one of the greatest moral failings in the eyes of society, especially if you are a young Black man. Um, but through all of this adversity, all the adversity that he experienced, he still continued to emanate intrepid light, love, and loyalty. Um, I was always greeted with the sarcastic, hey, little sis, and departed with an I love you more. But unfortunately, love, light, and loyalty wasn't enough as he was constantly rejected, rejected by those who were sworn to protect and serve. When my brother was lifeless on the kitchen floor, his palms, lips, and fingers steadily morphing into a dull blue, the police ignored him. APD blatantly ignored the fact that he may need some sort of medical assistance. We knew Andron, they said and he was being investigated for multiple crimes in the area and he was a no substance abuser, as if this made his life any less valuable, as if this was justification for leaving my brother, somebody's son, a human being, lifeless and unconscious to die alone. He was a child. He had a disease, he was sick, and he never received help. I will never stop fighting to eradicate and uproot the system that failed you habitually, the system that criminalized you, demonized you. I'm sorry. The system that criminalized you demonized you and ripped us apart physically, might I specify, not spiritually, as that bond is indestructible and everlasting. Even though I'm the big sister, the truth is Pop was always the one that protected me. I always felt safe with him. Even when we, we crashed our dad's car, uh, when he was around, there was a overwhelming sense of fervent and eccentric love and passion. And I never really realized how much his energy influenced mine until it was ripped away. But that's all to say that my brother did not simply overdose, but was a victim of cruel people in an even crueler system. Uh, I would say around the age of about 13, 14, um, he started experimenting with uh, marijuana, and then he started hanging around older guys that um, introduced him to the pills um, that he was taking. Um, when Andron was 15, he did have a fentanyl poisoning where he was um, had to be resuscitated. He was in a coma um, for a couple days, and he had to learn to walk and talk um, and everything again, because him and his friends decided to try a Percocet, um, in which he was already taking Xanax at that time. Um, once he was released from the hospital, I begged the whole community of Travis County to make it mandatory that he got in-house treatment. I was denied because in the state of Texas, um, at the age of 12, they have to consent and want treatment. Well, at the age that he was, he expressed to them that he didn't have a problem, so he never received the treatment that he needed. Poppy and I would always talk. He would call me or he would text me, you know, and maybe some changes, but not nothing just drastically. You know, he's still the same Poppy. Always call Nana and talk to Nana, and before we hang up or before we stop texting, he would always say, I love you, Nana, you know, so... Um, he had his, he had his problems, but he still was, 
protective and, you know, over his family, and he still was lovable. He was different, very, very different. He had a lot of hard comings in his life. I won't go into detail because I was asked not to, but it was a lot of stuff that, that a lot of people wouldn't have made it through. I knew he smoked weed and stuff like that, but, like, due to, like, some other stuff, wasn't really onto it because when really, ex I don't know how to explain it. He was actually doing very well, and he started high school, which, with, which all through middle school and elementary, he had the best teachers. Um, they were able to know what was his triggers and what kept him successful. Once he entered high school, um, they gave him an art. They told him what to do and what not to do to keep him successful, to keep his grades, um, because he has always been an A-B student to keep his grades up and um, to keep him active in school daily. They took his passion from him, which was basketball, and they did everything that the art asked them not to do. Um, that made my baby feel like his life was kind of over um, because that was his big dream to uh, play basketball. And so when they took it from him, it kind of left him in a very dark place. And so he kind of went downhill from there. I can just recall my last serious conversation with him and uh, he, was, he was crying. And uh, we were talking about God. And I told him just to pray. And he was like, God don't love me. If he did, why did he let this happen to me? I can't play basketball. I can't do anything. And I said, Andron, I said, you have to meet him halfway. I said, if you meet him halfway, he'll meet you the other half. I said, but he can't do it alone. And so he just felt like he never had a chance. On January 26, 2022, I received a phone call um, from the family house he was at, which was a little boy that I have asked him continuous times not to hang around. Um, but of course, when Andron has a friend, his loyalty is there. I got a call from the little girl stating that uh, he was not um, breathing. And I asked her, have you called the ambulance? And she said, no. And I said, well, why are you calling me? I didn't find out till after um, that the little boy, my son was hanging around. He, his, the little boy got into it with another little boy. That little boy came to that residence that night and shot up that house. The police was called, and when they came, my baby was in a room by himself on a deflated air mattress, laying on the floor. The police was there for a whole hour uh, while my baby laid on that floor, and they, they tried to say that they thought he was of another color, another race, and that he belonged to the duplex next door. The whole hour that he was there in the police report, it states that with my, my baby passed away within the hour of the paramedics arriving. That means my baby laid alone on that floor while that family was there and the police was there and nobody rendered aid to my child. They were there an entire hour. Soon as they left 10 minutes later, the family called me and I, I was the one that told them to call the ambulance. Uh, uh, my son has a friend over, and he's not he's not waking up. So his mom asked me to call the uh, call the ambulance. Okay, I have the ambulance already on the way. Uh, are you with him now? Yeah. Okay. Denise, listen carefully, and I'll tell you how to do chest compressions. Make sure he is flat on his back on the floor. Please yeah, he's flat on his back. On the breastbone, right between the nipples. Put your other hand on top of that hand. Pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second and two inches deep. Let the chest come all the way up between pumps. We're going to do this until help can take over. Count out loud so I can count with you. Okay.
Okay, you need to count way faster than that. One, two, three, four. 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 Please keep counting out loud, Denise, to make sure we're doing it correctly. His, I'll never forget that morning. His mom called me in uh, January 26, 2022, it was 6 18 a.m. in the morning when I got a call from Brandy. And she told me, she said, Miss Rosalind, Andrew is not breathing. I say, What do you mean he's not breathing? She said, He's not breathing. I said, Where is he? And she told me where he was. So she gave me the number to the home where he was. So I called and nobody answered. And so they, uh, the little girl called me back. And I said, I'm calling. I said, this is Andron's Nana. I'm calling to check on him. What, what's going on with my baby? Is he breathing? Is he breathing? So she didn't say anything. She put her mom on the phone. And I said, what's going on with my grandson? I say, is he breathing? Is he breathing? And the mom was just so nonchalant. Like, no, he's not. I mean, it was just no feeling or nothing. So I was just so distraught and I hung up. And then the next call I got that our baby was gone. I was at home asleep and my girlfriend, she was taking her daughter to school. And she came back hysterical, waking me up. So I'm I get up, I'm thinking, you know, she finna tell me something happened to one of the dolls or something, you know. And she told me, you need to sit up for this. And that's when she told me and it was that he had just passed. Worst feeling ever. I was in Houston for school um, and my sister called me like very frantic. At first, she didn't know what was going on. It was just like, you know, I, I don't, our, our brother's hurt, right? And then um, she told me that he passed away. And I lost it, broke down. I called my mom, crying frantically. Um, and then shortly after that, she came and got me from school. I was down here that same day. Um, with the family, which was, I felt like was exactly what I needed at the time. Um, cause being alone, I probably just would have went crazy. I was actually heading out on a, on my route. I drive trucks. I usually leave pretty, pretty early in the mornings, you know, three or four or five sometimes. So I'm not used to getting calls and I got a call from my mother. And I figured, well, you know, I'll call her back. Let me get to my first delivery. And then she called me again. And I was like, well, that's something like her to be calling me this early. Let me pull over. And I got pulled over. And uh, I, I could barely understand what she was telling me. She was very distraught, very upset. And that's when she told me that, that he had passed. And you know, I thought I didn't hear her correctly. And she told me again. And, and uh and I just, I was just in disbelief. I mean, it was like it was a dream almost. <sighs> My sister called me and she said, uh, I need you to go down to my house and get a Leah. because she's losing it. They just called me and told me that Enzron's not breathing. And all I could think is if I could just get there, I could save him. But I couldn't even find my clothes. I couldn't even get dressed. I was just walking in circles back and forth trying to find my clothes. 
to put my clothes on. And it took me forever to just get my clothes on and to get up the walkway to get my niece. And when I got there, the last time I seen my nephew, he was laying in a black body bag on a stretcher. And no one there seemed to care. My heart broke, like, that my best friend. Like, I, I never really had a best friend in my life. Like, I've always been moving around and stuff. And, like, that was just my best friend. Like, that was the only person I'd ever, like, really hang out with and do stuff with. So it just, it hurt me. It really hurt me. I was angry, upset, hurt, broke my steering wheel. Yeah. I had to like pull over on the side of the road and like calm down. It was just really, really hard. I'm still scarred to this day by that that call when when she'll call me in the morning just to say, Hey son, or how are you doing or whatever. And it takes me back to that to that morning. And I'm like, oh man, not and not this time. But uh, so it, it 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 still it still affects me uh, to to this day. That day, my heart just he just took part of me with him because I will never ever be the same again. When people see me, they think I'm okay, but inside I'm not okay. My heart is breaking, and I feel like I'd be dying sometime because he's not here anymore for senseless, you know, because, you know, he, he's laying there and nobody thinks to check on him. That's just heartless, very heartless. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think about it. I mean, it's just, like I said, when he left, part of me left with him, you know, and there's guilt there, you know, it's just, I feel like I could have done more you know, talk to him more, but it's definitely, it's it's hard. It's definitely hard to deal with. Like, don't nobody know what you're going through until it actually happens. It's easy to say, you know, I know how you're feeling, but it's the feeling you can't explain. Losing a child, for sure. Dude, without them, I would've just like went through it alone, you know, like, Nobody was really there for me, except for Andrew. So. His family kind of helped. Yeah, they still continue. Like, they're my family. Like, they do a lot of stuff for me that my own family never did. So. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, every day. Every day. I mean, I was, uh, he was, he was always a, like they said, a very energetic kid. He was ambitious. I was, you know, looking to, looking forward to, you know, seeing what he was capable of or could accomplish when he got grown because of his ambition. Uh, he was a very loyal kid. I mean, loyal to a fault. I just think he unfortunately gave that loyalty to a group that didn't deserve it. And... Uh, you know, we could we could go back and say what well, we should have or shouldn't did, but I mean, the fact still remains. I feel like, for starters, I'm a more of an empathetic person. I'm more receptive to the things that people might be going through, and the ways that they might might be coping with those things that they're going through, um, and. I think it just really opened my eyes to social ills, right? Like, none of this was his fault. I'm mad. I'm hurt. I'm angry. I'm driven. I'm more focused. And I won't stop. 
until we get justice for my nephew because he deserves that. He did not deserve to die. There's still some very important unanswered questions, but I mean, we'll just just have to see what the future holds as far as far as that goes. Uh, like like his mother said, we're we're not going to stop asking though. I mean, even if it's inconvenient or you know worrisome for somebody, we you know we want to know what happened to our to our Andron. Uh, his 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 life meant something to all of us, and we're not gonna let that let that go. I'm determined to find out what happened to my baby, because they took something from me that I would never be able to get back. My baby meant absolutely nothing to that family, and he meant absolutely nothing to the police. But he was everything to his family. I wish people would see these children as children and stop looking at these children as addicts and junkies because somewhere down the line in their life, they have had some kind of traumatic experience that has led them to do the things that they are doing. Everyone that does drugs does not do them just because they want to do them. They have some form of a traumatic experience that has happened in their life. And so people really need to open their eyes and see these babies for what has happened to them or what they are going through and try to help them instead of trying to label them. There is a big stigma, not only a stigma around substance abuse disorder, but a stigma around black youth in general, right? Like the media has, the media politicians have pushed this narrative um, of young black men being criminals, um, criminalized them, lab labeled them criminals um, on the media day in and day out, right? It's all we see on, on TV. So. There's a big stigma, and that stigma definitely played a huge role in my brother's death. Lose the stigma. You can't judge a person if you don't know what they went through. There's one thing that sticks in my mind. Um, an angel mom lost her 17-year-old son, and she said, they only knew your troubles, but they didn't know your struggles. And that has stuck with me, and that is so true of my son. You don't know what he was going through that caused his behavior and, and that drove him to want to take drugs to mask the pain and the depression or whatever it was that he was feeling in that moment. You don't know him like that, so you can't judge him. My son was a very loving, caring person. He would give the shirt off his back to anyone. I tried to find a silver lining in the situation because, I mean, unfortunately we lost him, but with his mom and the rest of our families, you know, fighting uh, for the advocacy of, of the whole, you know, to get the word about the dangers of fentanyl and to see him on on billboards and part of movements to kind of get that word out. It makes me feel like he's helping to fix fix the issue. Um because that's the kind of kid he was. Like like they said, he would he would always want to be the life of the party. Um and I just I'm just it's just good good to see that his he, he he's helping to maybe prevent some other families from having experience what his went through. My family has been a great support. And then, of course, the angel moms that I have connect, connected with in the community. Um, I like to advocate and speak out. Um, you know, like they say, we can't save our children, but hopefully we can save someone else's. That gives me comfort. I have my days. Um, I have good days and I have bad days. Um, most of my bad days come from 
thinking about my baby dying alone when he could have been saved, when he could have been given a chance to live, um, and to see my daughter grow up without her best friend because they were really close. And he was my everything. He was me and my daughter's life. He was our protector. And we don't have that anymore. Kind of feels like, I know I have people around me, but like my brother was my best friend and stuff. So sometimes I feel like I don't have anyone and it's just me and stuff like that. Watch who you hang around. Definitely don't trust nobody. People should really stop taking pills altogether, whether you get them prescribed from the doctor or you get them off the streets. Man, watch your friends. Watch who you call your friends. I mean, please leave the drugs alone. Like, man, you can try one drug and think you're just going to stick with that. Eventually, it might, might not lead to something else, but, man, you don't even want to risk it. Don't trust anyone. It's the first thing. Don't let your guard down. And just one pill can kill, obviously, things like that. And sometimes you're not always taking what you expect to be taking and things like that. But, I mean, you know, he's still here. You, you can't ever, you, you can kill my flesh, but you can't. Get rid of my spirit, he's still here.